don't know. Great. So thank you all so much for being here. So Professor Lockwood, if you can just state your name and tell us a little bit about your organization. Okay. Uh, I'm Bert Lockwood. Uh, I'm a faculty member at the University of uh, Cincinnati uh, Law School. Um, I came to Cincinnati in 1979 because Cincinnati received a private gift to establish the first program in international human rights law. Um, and the purpose of the program was both educating, developing the uh, uh, area of international uh, human rights and training students to um, uh, in that area. And so one of the things we do is we place uh, law students after their first year um, in the summers uh, with human rights groups uh, around the world. And um, that has been a real sort of magnet, if you will, for that's attractive to uh, students. Um, because they're doing it after the first summer, they still have two more years of law school. And so we all sort of benefit from uh, the experiences that they've they've had. Uh, just as an example, this this past uh, two years, we've sent someone to uh, New Zealand to work with the New Zealand Human Rights Commission, and they've had a, a just a a wonderful experience. But um, others went recently to work with a uh, NGO who in Greece, who um, principally focuses upon assisting refugees who uh, um, are um, homosexuals in terms of uh, the asylum process. And those are difficult uh, cases, but uh, we've, we've sent um, students the past two years to work with that uh, group. It's one of their uh, lawyers is one of our graduates, and so that's been been helpful. We have a longstanding um, uh, program with um, uh, Botswana, where we've worked for, uh, I guess, now about 30 years uh, with uh, Unity Dow, who led the struggle for gender equality in Botswana. And um, uh, we worked initially on her litigation challenging um, a gender discriminatory provision of a citizenship act uh, where we were successful over about a five year period of um, uh, through the initial court and then the uh, appellate courts. Um, but we have continued working with uh, unity in various capacities. She um, uh, became the first Judge, female judge in Botswana, and we began sending students. Uh, she served for 10 years on that, on the, the High Court of Botswana, and we began sending students to clerk for her um, uh, and other judges on that uh, court. Um, and then she was foreign minister, and we sent students to uh, work with her and minister of education similarly. So um, they, they have those uh, wonderful experience. The other principal activity, I think, for which we're known is um, we edit the uh, Human Rights Quarterly, um, which is a public um, multidisciplinary publication um, of the uh, Johns Hopkins University um, Press. And this is my, I think I just began my 42nd year of um, editing the Human Rights Quarterly. Um, I think it's widely recognized as being the leading uh, academic journal in the, the human rights field. And I believe the reason for that is the hybrid way in which we edit the quarterly. Um, I make the decisions as to what gets published, but the actual editing of the articles are done by about a 60 person staff at uh, the law school. We, we 
even though we're multidisciplinary, we follow sort of the law review style of editing where every footnote is checked for form and accuracy by the students. It's a very time consuming process. But what we strive for is um, uh, that any article that appears in the quarterly ought to be able to be understood by the literate reader. And I tell the uh, student staff with all sincerity to achieve that standard um, they are uh, better editors than I would be because um, I've been in the field for like 50 years and there's just an awful lot that I take for granted. So if they have trouble understanding something that an author is saying, they need to work with the author to make it understandable because I think they will be similar to many of the readers um, uh, uh, of the uh, the quarterly, and as I say, I think that's been, I think we by and large have achieved that uh, standard. And um, uh, the other thing that I'm sort of proud of with respect to that is that um, uh, in the um, 42 years that I've edited the quarterly, every issue has been mailed to the subscribers in the month of scheduled publication, which. I think is a record unparalleled in academic publishing and how it translates is that no student staff wants to be the first ones to break the record, if you will. So um, I've been fortunate that the students understand the importance of uh, what they are doing um, and, and, you know, work very, very hard to uh, achieve that. The, we then do um, a number of, uh, conferences. I have a bunch of uh, uh, distinguished visitors that uh, uh, come in. We we have dinner, what I call dinner conversations. Like last night, we have a, uh, a professor from Colombia who's Hungarian, um, who is teaching a short course. Um, uh, our regular classes begin on Monday. Um, but uh, we had a dinner with her and with the students and talking about uh, the situations both in Colombia and in, in Hungary. And what I have found with those dinner conversations um, is that in that sort of more relaxed um, environment, one, the visitors feel honored that they're having sort of a dinner in their honor, but um, they also tend to be very open and candid and not sort of worried that what they say is going to, you know, end up in a headline in some kind of press some someplace. So um, they, they turn out to be some of the most memorable evenings of uh, one's law school uh, life. We uh, recently had um, uh, the leading lawyer from uh, Nigeria, a uh, human rights lawyer from Nigeria, who's recently accepted a uh, position at Tufts uh, University for three years. Um, but he was out and talking about his work. He heads up the, their Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. And in fact, in the uh, August issue of the quarterly, which is this August, which is out, um, uh, he has the lead article uh, in the, uh, the the quarterly. Um, the um, uh, but we will host um, uh, when I was on the board of Amnesty, um, we began hosting. Um, uh, I think we did the first three conferences of lawyers in the U.S. that work with Amnesty International. Um, I've done a series of conferences uh, co-sponsored with Paul Hoffman, who is a Los Angeles lawyer who is the principal lawyer who has argued international human rights cases uh, in the Supreme Court. Um, and we've done a, a series of conferences bringing together lawyers, basically um, 
brainstorm litigation strategies um, uh, uh, for international human rights cases uh, in the in the U.S. And I, I think we'll probably be doing an, another one of those in uh, this this coming spring, but partly depends on the money. Um, uh, the um, Kara, I'm going to stop there and, and let you. Well, I guess I should mention that um, I also have a book series with the University of Pennsylvania Press, which essentially is the human rights quarterly um, in books. And so there, we've published 176 uh, books in that series, have a number of them that are in the pipeline. Um, uh, one of the, the, the latest one deals um, uh, with uh, gender, uh, frontiers of gender equality, and it's edited by Rebecca Cook, uh, who heads up the International Women's Program at the University of Toronto uh, uh, Law School. Um, and I'm using that in the course that I'm teaching this semester on women's uh, uh, human rights. Um, uh, the and and we actually have the other book that just came out at the the same time um, is uh, one by sort of a, a memoir by Bill Schultz, who for a twelve year period um, was the head of um, uh, Amnesty International USA, um, and it's. It's a wonderful read, but it's basically his reflections on uh, his his time, principally. I mean, it's about his whole life, but it's principally about the the time um, with with amnesty. Um, that's the Human Rights Quarterly. Okay, so I now I will stop there and go in any direction you would like me to go well thank you it's clear your work is very interesting and just incredible it's clear you're very passionate about your work so why do you think that human rights education is important um human rights is uh the idea of our time um and it represents basically the struggle for uh social justice in communities around the around the world um it often is challenging power and when you have societies which are um ruled by dictators or uh, repressive governments, um, uh, the lives of uh, ordinary people are um, uh, impacted. Um, and there is there, there are wonderful people um, around the world that are struggling to make their societies more just. Um, and uh, I think it's important uh, for us in the uh, human rights field to assist them in that and to understand that the, the challenge um, stems in good part from uh, 1945, um, which was the founding of the United Nations. And it ushered in a revolution in terms of international law. Prior to 1945, what a nation did to its own citizens was by and large its own business, that international law didn't have anything to say. There are a few important exceptions, but that's basically the, the, the black letter law on it. 
with the founding of the United Nations um, in the aftermath of the Holocaust, um, there was a recognition that um, uh, conflict is often um, a result of injustices for human rights. And so there was for the first time in articles 55 and 56, nations um, made a, uh, the join the UN um, made a pledge to promote and protect fundamental human rights and freedoms. Well, the first great challenge um, was to define what are human rights and fundamental freedoms. Um, and a good deal was uh, made by what we will be celebrating on December 10th, its 75th anniversary, is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a remarkable document. Um, it was a document um, done by the uh, UN Human Rights uh, Commission, headed up by Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, and it spells out what were viewed as basic human rights. And it's remarkable because it includes not only the civil and political rights that most Americans see reflected in our Constitution's Bill of Rights, but also uh, equally important uh, economic, social, and, and cultural rights, um, which for many people um, uh, are even more important or equally important as the civil and political. Um, as Franklin Roosevelt uh, said that, um, uh, What's his expression? Um, I'm going to paraphrase it because I'm not going to remember the exact language, but essentially, um, if if one doesn't have their basic needs um, uh, satisfied, that other rights pale in comparison. And um, I, I think we've seen this uh, much evidence to, to support that. So um, that then following up that in terms of developing what the law was, is there, We, I think the world has been quite successful in terms of um, negotiating and um, uh, adopting uh, a number of important treaties um, that deal both broadly with civil and political rights, economic and social, but then sort of special ones like Convention on uh, Disabilities, um, uh, the uh, CEDA, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women uh, being it. Been successful in drafting those, the real challenge, and it was the challenge that you could have anticipated from 1945, is the implementation. I mean, after you defined what the rights are is that they're actual Im implementation. And the record with respect to that is much more checkered, if you will. I don't think that's surprising because human rights by their definition are either um, prohibitions on what a government can do or obligations that they must fulfill. And I think one could have predicted that you'd be more successful defining those than the implementation um, uh, of that. And so that's part of our great challenge is getting uh, uh, nations to um, observe um, uh, human rights. And that is um, continuing to be um, uh, a rather significant uh, challenge in most countries of the world. So. Yes. And so our last 
question is how has HRE USA influenced you in your work? How has being a part of the organization influenced you? Uh, well, that's a tough one for me to, to, to answer. Um, uh, I know I've I published Betty Reardon's book in my pen series, which I think um, was a K through 12 uh, teaching resource on um, learning about <laughs> rights and responsibilities. She at the time was at uh, Columbia's teacher college. This is a, uh, a book that, um, I think came out of that human rights education um, uh, network. Um, and I think that's probably the most ex explicit um, uh, part of it. Um, I'm trying to think if the conferences, um, well, I know we had um, for a number of years, well, uh, I think the Principal motivating force was Barb, Barbara Fry at um, uh, Minnesota, but we had a Midwest coalition um, uh, meeting. Um, that organization that I think lasted for I think at least ten years, um, where people shared uh, annually. Um, uh, what their different centers were doing, um, as well as sort of co-sponsoring uh, different uh, conferences. Um, uh, Flowers, Nancy Flowers. Um, hmm. I know uh, we did a, uh, I was mentioning the Paul Hoffman connection, but one of the um, conferences we did together was um, uh, recognizing uh, Joan Fitzpatrick, um, who was a uh, law professor at uh, the University of Washington's law school, who uh, passed away uh, too early. And I hosted a conference uh, with Paul at Cincinnati, um, uh, bringing together friends of hers. And she was very much involved in um, uh, a number of the uh, activities of um, uh, dealing with the human rights education uh, stuff. Um, what was the, uh, there was an Israeli woman who- um, Stula Koenig, and that's- and and I think Bert. So she had that con. Well, the conference out at Harvard, um, not Harvard. I think it was at Columbia um, for in 1992. I think one of the very first conferences in October of 92 that brought a lot of the higher education and um, K-12 human rights educators together to think about what the future of this and I think. Um, she hosted it with, um, oh, who was, um, Steve, Steve Marks. Oh, Steve okay. Marks, I believe. And I think you were there. And I, I do think your publication with Betty Reardon came out kind of on the heels of that, along with that oh. first human rights education in the 21st century, if I remember. Yeah. But, publication date is 95. So it would have been. Right. Uh, or, in the past well, no, but in press, uh, uh -huh. that, that makes sense. Um, and I think you hosted, if I'm not, I actually wrote about it um, in my recent uh, dissertation, one of the very first human rights education conferences at Cincinnati. And you brought, um, well, Felicia Ban from the Philippines, I know, came and that's where I first uh, met her. And I was trying to remember what year that was, but it was in the 1990s after maybe 90, 
put it about 94. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not remembering all these things, but. Uh, no, you've done so much. Yeah, the uh, uh, those have been those conferences have been wonderful in terms of bringing people together and 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 often the the function of the conference or I think its importance is not necessarily what is publicly said in the presentations, but it's often what is taking place over coffee and drinks and food, uh, the networking. Um, that where people uh, can discuss and strategize on uh, dealing uh, with things, but uh, yeah, we've we, we've done um, uh, the the Sri Lanka was um, uh, Radhika Kermaswamy was the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, and uh, I know we did a conference um, honoring her, but uh, uh, her work, um, uh, and recently we've been doing uh, a little catch up on uh, the situation, which is that good in in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, no, and you know, I've always sort of understood the um, importance of bringing non-lawyers into um, uh, this work. Um, and uh, that's, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you've been really um, instrumental, I think, in, in doing the interdisciplinary work of bringing individuals from yeah, the non-lawyers to the, you know, the um, political scientists to, I mean, across the board, all of the different disciplines. And I think, um, and we've, I, done, I know, we've done a lot with the uh, anthropology, which often has, I, sometimes looking back, um, I, I think uh, I, I went to a small liberal arts college, uh, uh, St. Lawrence, um, and one of the uh, negatives about small liberal arts colleges is smaller faculties. And so I think my favorite course was a, an introduction to anthropology, but we had one anthropologist uh, and for two of the three years I could have taken courses, uh, he was away on you know, sabbatical kinds of stuff. Uh, and uh, but uh, one of the things in the in the quarterly and in my book series, uh, I think some of the most interesting books are done by anthropologists and just the kinds of questions they ask are, um, I think, sometimes more interesting than the lawyers. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but that's, you know, part of the the, the richness of the uh, of the of the field. Uh, um, yeah. Anything and what else? do you okay. oh, what I, what do you think about the future of human rights education? We have um, and human rights learning. We have the seventy fifth anniversary, as you've mentioned, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights coming up. You know what? Would, what do you hope that the future um, has in store? And if you're advising. Kind of the next generation of uh, human rights advocates and uh, activist scholars. Um, what what would you like the message to be to them? Well, let let me say that I've um, never had difficulty uh, attracting students to the subject matter. Um, I think. Uh, human rights and the issues and the problems that it deals with um, are inherently um, interesting uh, for students to find out more about. Um, and so I'm not worried with respect to somehow the subject matter becoming less relevant 
or less interesting. I think it's clear. Um, I'm, I'm someone that reads the New York Times daily and has for 50 years. Um, but I would say in any, pick up any issue of the uh, uh, New York Times and uh, 30 to 40 percent of its um, articles um, on a daily basis deal with human rights issues. I mean, I, what, one of the reasons I read it daily is because I have a strong feeling that if I'm going to keep up with uh, the important issues, um, they're happening on a daily basis. So, um, uh, although I will say that I, I, I had a daughter who talked me into um, going to Barbie and thinking that it was in, important for, because I was going to be teaching the women's human rights seminar to, um, and, and I think I fell asleep in it. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure <laughs> that I'm on the cutting edge uh, anymore, but uh, yeah. The um, and and well, maybe maybe I should wear pink to my first um, uh, Wednesday seminar. I have to think about that. Um, but uh, have you seen Barbie? Either of you? No, no. Okay. Well, I tried to get to go with um, my niece's uh, nephews twice, but it was sold out, so we oh, we didn't really? make it in. Oh. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah no i went um we we have a, a a neighborhood theater but it was uh early like a four o'clock showing or something and uh, uh i think i was one of about eight people uh seeing it so i guess i guess cincinnati's not as big a draw as minneapolis so. <laughs> Well, but do you remember the human rights concerts that, and did they have any influence on you? Because I, I think we need to be bringing those back uh, with the 75th. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I I never went to any of them. Um, and I know I'm uh, unusual in the sense that um, I'm not attracted to um concerts like that uh, events just um yeah it's it's not something that um i've, I've ever made an effort to uh, uh to go to so um the uh you you are correct however christy in terms of reaching audiences um that those uh celebrities and in, in, in concerts have been uh, important. I think we've seen this um, uh, in, in an analog, not a concert, but the same sort of motivation uh, with uh, uh, George Clooney um, and now, now his wife. Um, uh, uh, that has um, uh, their being at events clearly attract lots of people um, that are there to basically uh, see them. She actually, um, I think, uh, so I read a book uh, about one of the Uyghurs um, uh, and I read a book by um, uh, she was Yazidi. She was the um, uh, in in the area of Syria, the 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 group that was um, uh, genocide against. Um, uh, and both of those individuals, um, and actually, and I think it may even be one of the. Uh, doctors from the uh, Congo. Um, but I was struck that um, she represented 
um, them in in their different legal challenges, but that um, two or three of them actually won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, but I'm sure that um, somehow she played a role in uh, attracting attention to their uh, situations. Um, but yeah, the, the, the Clooney's are actually sort of from the Cincinnati area. Um, but I, I, one of my failures is I've never been successful at attracting him to, uh, uh, to, to come to the Morgan program, which I, I would love to do. His father was a, uh, prominent, um, uh, newscaster on one of the local stations for many years. Um, so, and I guess one of, one of his movies that he did was a, a, a tribute to his father. Uh, uh, and, uh, well, well, I think we need to somehow really uh, recognize this amazing work you've done. Uh, 43 years or 42 years with the Human Rights Quarterly and how many, what did you say on the University of Pennsylvania Press? Was it 80, 176 books? Yeah, 176 books. Um, it's incredible. And, um, yeah, and I, they asked me to put that series together beginning in um, 1980. And actually the first book in the series is still um, one of my favorites. And it was sort of an unusual book um, from uh, uh, an academic uh, series. And so I got this manuscript um, uh, from a journalist named Ian Guest. Um, and uh, he was a journalist for uh, British uh, newspapers, but he covered the Geneva scene. And so the book was behind the disappearances and it dealt with the dirty mm -hmm. war in uh, Argentina. And it sort of had three areas that it focused on. Washington DC, US foreign policy toward the situation, Argentina on the ground situation. But then the third was Geneva. And it was about the inside story of how the Argentine government attempted to prevent the UN human rights bodies that are centered in um, Geneva uh, from taking up the issue of Argentina. And he probably was the only person in the world who could have written that part of it. Um, mm -hmm. And so he, had taken it to a commercial publisher and they said they would publish it, but they wanted to take out the Geneva part of it. <laughs> and uh, so uh, he said it to me, when he said it, it had no footnotes or anything, you know, sort of documenting. But if I was interested, he um, uh, would supply those. And so uh, that was the first book and it's called Behind the Disappearances, but it really reads sort of like a novel. There's, there's something about journalists, uh, their ability to tell stories is, is you know, yeah, in, impressive. Um, and so, as I say, it reads sort of like a, a, a novel, but it's still one of my favorite books, but that was, so that, that would have come out in, um, I think 1990 would have been, yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah. So that ser series started in 1990, and then the Human Rights Quarterly started in 1981. Is that right? Uh, let's see. The Human Rights Quarterly, um, it's which is sort of an interesting story of how that came about. Um, I taught. Uh, the first class at American University Law School in International Human Rights when I was the associate dean there. And I 
taught it in the evening. And in that first class, amongst others, I had like five or six foreign service officers. Uh, 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 and this um, political scientist from the University of Maryland, um, uh, uh, who had already written a book on human rights. His name was Richard Claude. And um, so that would have been in like 1976. And um, uh, he started a, uh, a journal that for its first two years was called Universal Human Rights and published by a private um, uh, publisher, Earl Coleman. Um, and then beginning with volume three, it became Human Rights Quarterly and shifted to Johns Hopkins University Press. Well, when he heard I was going to Cincinnati, uh, at, at Cincinnati, um, with the uh, doing this first program, he approached me and it, it had become too much work for him and was wondering if I would be willing to take it over. Well, I jumped at the opportunity because one of the big worries I had about starting a human rights program in Cincinnati, Ohio, is, you know, I spent the previous 10 years in Manhattan and Washington, DC, where there's all sorts of international human rights stuff going on. Uh, but I think it's fair to say at the time, there was nothing going on in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, uh, dealing with human rights. So I sort of thought this would be a perfect thing for students associated with the program to do as an activity. Um, and so I, I absolutely jumped at the um, uh, opportunity to, to do it. Um, and so, yeah, that, I guess we probably would have started around 81 or 82, uh, but volume four, three is the first one I picked up. Where are we now? Uh, let's I think we are. Yeah, we are uh, on volume 45 now. So the, um, uh, and then um, I was, uh, I think it was like 1988, uh, um, the University of Pennsylvania wrote to me and asked if I would be willing to put together a uh, a book series for them. And um, the, I said, yes. And they said, well, write us a proposal. And I said, fine. And so it was like six months went by and I hadn't written a proposal. And they came back and said, you know, we really want you to do this. And I recognized that um, why I was hesitating. And, and it was because I was already feeling guilty that I wasn't doing um, a significant scholarship myself in the human rights field. And I realized that if I took on a book series with the University of Pennsylvania Press, I would be doing it with the same goal that I uh, had with the quarterly of making it the most important um, book series in, in, in human rights, and that that would be at least a 20-year uh, commitment. But what it would mean is that I would be doing no uh, significant scholarship, just not enough hours in the, in, in the day. And I came to recognize that I sort of enjoyed this 
position of being an entrepreneur, entrepreneur in terms of um, publishing stuff uh, of others in, in the human rights field. And so I sort of said yes, and that's uh, how it has worked out. But I've been very um, uh, fortunate uh, in, in, in my field uh, to be able to um, uh, make these contributions and you know, there's just so many good people in the uh, uh, human rights field um, that it's a real uh, uh, pleasure and opportunity. And like I said, been blessed with health. So uh, continuing, continuing on. I have I have a big one coming up in February. That's uh, eight oh. So yeah. <laughs> well, happy early birthday. And it's amazing. Kind of 42 years with quarterly and you're, gosh, hitting, what is it? Almost 40, well, well a lot of years in all this whole work. And so thank you so much for everything that you've done. And well, Kara, do you, yeah, do you want to say? Thank, thank you. Yeah, just. Thank you so much for everything you've done. Thank you for meeting with us today. I actually want to be a human rights lawyer and I'm the editor for a human rights blog that we have at LB. And so it's been super interesting listening to everything you've been saying. And, and what year are you in? I'm this going into my junior year. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll still be around. Um, you'll, you'll consider Cincinnati. So. With, I would, will. Love, would love to have you here. Um, it's a small law school, um, which is nice, uh, in a huge university. So we sort of have the benefits of um, uh, both the that you get to know all your classmates, um, uh, but the benefit of having all, all sorts of other activities that going on in, within the university, many of which relate to, to human rights. But um, uh, we've been, as I say, sort of successful in, in attracting people. We have a new dean, just began, and he is the uh, uh, an Iraqi American, and he is the first Muslim dean of a law school in uh, the US, So, um, which, we didn't know it, that wasn't sort of a consideration. We didn't know it at the time that he, he mentioned that in his sort of an open letter to, to the community. Um, that was the first time I realized that it was a, a first. So, um, but he was, uh, uh, his one of his uh, mentors was, um, a Sudanese uh, fellow who um, uh, was at Human Rights Watch when I first came in contact with him, Abdullahi Anaim. And um, he came out to one of the conferences and I said to him, you know, you're, you're an academic, not, not sort of the, uh, the activist type. You really need to, uh, uh, get it at a, at a law faculty and um, he jumped at that opportunity and we uh, made an effort to, to get him and once we sort of expressed an interest uh, the reg was pulled uh, from us by Emory um, and uh, so he went he went on Emory's faculty but uh, part of the reason was he had five kids and uh, Atlanta was the city where Northern Africans apparently mostly go to um, in uh, when they're uh, seeking uh, asylum. So he thought it would be a, a, a better place for his uh, kids um, and family growing up. So, so. But uh, yeah, so very good. <laughs> 